When you board an airplane, you probably don't expect it to break in flight. You assume that a certain standard of maintenance has been carried out that would keep the plane you're flying on in an airworthy state. Airplanes are made up of upwards of millions of individual parts. The failure of any one of them could result in outcomes ranging from negligible and unnoticeable all the way up to catastrophic, meaning certain fatal injury. When Air Maria Flight 1121 left for a very short flight in French Polynesia, its occupants certainly couldn't have been prepared for what would happen to their plane just moments into the flight. Aviation history is littered with disasters and incidents which stem from the failure of critical aircraft elements. Whether these be in the area of poor maintenance or just general wear and tear is down to the individual case. For this video, we're going to examine a disaster which occurred with a particular plane which is known for its toughness. The Canadian-built de Havilland DHC-6 Twin Otter is a plane which suits many different roles. Officially classed as a utility plane, they can be found pretty much all over the world. Around 1,000 of these planes built over the years serve hard-to-reach airports, airports with unusual terrain, or simply serving short routes carrying just a handful of people at a time. It was this purpose that the airline Air Maria saw the Twin Otter to be useful. Air Maria was an airline based in French Polynesia, operating out of the famous island of Tahiti, but taking the name of the neighboring island of Maria. Tahiti's Far Airport was the home of the airline between the years of 1968 and 2010 when it eventually ceased operations. The airline provided a network of flights in and around the Polynesian Islands. Many of the airline's passengers connected through Tahiti on international flights, often holidaymakers looking for the quiet getaway that these islands can provide. For the vast majority of the airline's life, it enjoyed a reputable safety record. On August 9, 2007, things would change for the airline as the disaster of Air Maria Flight 1121 occurred. The accident occurred on a short flight between Maria and Tahiti. To call this flight short would be an understatement. It's one of the shortest commercial flights in the world, with a distance of roughly 10 miles or 18 kilometers between the two airports, roughly seven minutes of flying time. The cruising altitude on such a flight was just 600 feet. Given the number of seats of the plane which performed such route and the demand for this trip, Flights between Tahiti and Maria were performed up to 50 times per day. This meant that Air Maria's planes were in service more frequently than usual. This amounted to the accident to an otter plane accumulating 55,000 takeoffs and landings across 30,000 flight hours. Flight 1121 was expected to depart at just before midday. The flight was packed with every seat fully booked, amounting to 19 passengers. On these short flights, there was only one pilot flying the plane. On this occasion, that pilot's name was Michel Santorin, age 53. Originating from French Polynesia himself, he had accumulated over 3,500 flight hours total and was hired by Air Maria just three months prior to the accident. At 11.53 that morning, Captain Santorin began his preparations for the flight to Tahiti once his passengers had boarded. With just one member of crew on board, he was also responsible for giving the safety briefing which was done over the PA. Four minutes later, local air traffic control cleared the small propeller plane to taxi down to runway 12. Over the next three minutes, flight 1121 would make its way out to the runway and line up for takeoff. It was exactly midday when Flight 1121 was given its takeoff clearance and the Twin Otter's engines were powered up. Such a small plane does not require as much speed or runway to get airborne than other planes. Operating in tight spaces is one thing the Twin Otter is known for. As expected, the plane lifted off the ground and began climbing. Shortly after takeoff, the captain retracted the plane's flaps. It was in this moment, as the plane passed through just 400 feet of altitude, that a catastrophic failure would occur. We're going to pause right here and examine in a bit more detail what component actually failed, and to do that, 
we need to take a closer look at the Twin Otter plane itself. The Twin Otter has a very distinctive design, with its wings mounted on top of the fuselage and the horizontal stabilizer mounted on the tail fin. Just like any other plane, pilots of the Twin Otter control the plane with the standard control surfaces of ailerons, rudder, and elevator. Many commercial passenger planes have these control surfaces powered by a hydraulic system. The hydraulic fluid in said system is often referred to as the blood of the plane. The Twin Otter, however, works a bit differently. According to a specifications publication from Viking, one of the plane's manufacturers, the only hydraulic system on the plane powers the flaps and the nose wheel steering. The typical control surfaces here are connected to the pilot's control wheel via a complicated system of cables and pulleys. When the pilot influences the control wheel, the cable system pushes and pulls in the appropriate way to deflect the control surfaces as needed. These cables themselves are made of 132 strands of wrapping wiring which gives the cable its high tensile strength. When the investigation into Flight 1121 looked into the wreckage of the plane, it was deduced that the critical failure occurred in the cable which connects the elevator or pitch of the plane with the pilot's control wheel. The cable wirings themselves were originally made from a carbon steel, but these were replaced on the Axton aircraft with stainless steel wiring. This was suggested to help with corrosion effects. The plane's manufacturer recommended the stainless steel cables for tropical climates and higher saline environments. What the airline failed to account for was the necessary maintenance needed to upkeep these planes given the number of flights they performed. Air Maria's operations of their planes were unusually high, which led to a greater level of simple wear and tear over the years. No adjustments to the maintenance schedule was made to account for this. The investigation also found another factor contributing to the wearing down of these cables. For this, we should redirect our attention from Maria Airport to that of Tahiti's far airport. The airport here is only small. Air Maria parked and operated from this section of the apron. It is believed that jet blasts from larger airliners whilst the accident plane was parked here contributed to the disaster. Though served by many small planes on the daily, Tahiti is also served by multiple international air carriers. At the time, Air New Zealand operated a Boeing 767 to the airport, Air France a 747. Hawaiian Airlines also operated a 767, but also for a time operated a McDonnell Douglas DC-10 here. Not least of which deserves a mention is the Tahitian airline itself, Air Tahiti Nui, which operated numerous Airbus A340 planes out of FAR. Point is, the airport, despite being small, was no stranger to large planes. To quote the own words of the investigation as detailed in the analysis section of the accident report, the accident plane was parked near A340 type wide-body airplanes. Calculations showed that the jet blasts from the engines of these airplanes could result in a load above the stress failure level for a worn cable. These factors all culminated in the cables chafing against the internal harnesses and buckles of the plane, wearing them down over time. On the subject of the chafing, here is the accident report, quote, The wear on the cable where it failed was due to its chafing on the polymede bush located in the cable guide. This wear was significant. Due to the structure of the cable, it had affected all of the strands except the central strand, and had led to the failure or the almost destruction in cross-section of 72 wires out of the 132 that made up the cable. At just after midday on August 9, 2007, the cable wiring which allows the pilot to manipulate the pitch axis, or more specifically as the accident report puts it, quote, the pitch up cable, failed and broke. In this moment, the captain was heard on the cockpit voice recording giving a verbal indication that he knew something was immediately wrong. As many eyewitnesses who watched the plane take off from Maria that day noted, the aircraft then suddenly pitched downward. There was not a whole lot that Captain Santoren could have done to save the plane. Air Maria Flight 1121 
impacted the water at precisely 12.01 and 20 seconds, taking the lives of all 20 people on board. As French Polynesia is an overseas French territory, the crash of Flight 1121 was investigated by European authorities. It was concluded in the investigation that the cause of the crash was the breaking of the plane's own internal control wiring, for reasons we have already discussed. The investigation also looked towards the airline Air Maria, saying they did not provide adequate training to pilots with regard to a sudden loss of pitch, also going on further to highlight the lack of amendments to maintenance schedules given the frequency of the plane's usage. Going forward, all Twin Otter planes were to be inspected for chafing of the control cables. It's highlighted that inspections of the planes should be done on a calendar basis in the context of an operator like Air Maria. The European Aviation Safety Agency was recommended to take jet blasts into account when aircraft are to be certified. Hello everyone, thank you so much for watching this video. I had a bit of an issue with trying to find the correct livery that Air Maria used for this plane for the flight simulator. I sort of had to improvise. If you found this video to be interesting though, be sure to leave a like and subscribe as there is always a new video every Saturday. A big thank you to my patrons over on Patreon for their amazing ongoing support. Their names are on the screen right now. If you're interested in joining the Patreon, you'll get early access to all new content two days before it goes out publicly on YouTube, and you can obtain that perk from the lowest tier of just £1 per month. If you want to support me even further and have your name on screen, then you can join from £3 per month and the link to the Patreon will be in the pinned comment below. Anyway, I was really happy with how this video turned out. I thought it was very interesting. I do have a list of incidents to cover. I take note of a lot of your suggestions or recommendations. Research is always ongoing, so if you don't see yours or multiple people's requests straight away, it's probably because I just haven't gotten around to it yet. Anyway, with all that said, thank you so much for watching. I'm going to sign off this video now. Have a great day and I will see you next week. Goodbye.